members, uh, I would like to welcome you all on the SSBD FRES's Awareness Day webinar. Uh, um, uh, Saudi Society of Blood Disorders is uh, a society that cover all the aspects of uh, hematological disorders and um, uh, glad to share with you today uh, um, the uh, um, um, awareness about the apheresis, which is uh, an important subject for all uh, uh, care providers in the field of hematology, be it physician, technologist, nurses, and even general physicians and hematologists. Uh, the apheresis is one of the modalities held a lot and a lot of um, uh, future uh, uh, promises in, in introduction of new list of treatments as we get uh, more knowledge about use of apheresis. Tonight, uh, we will be having a panel of experts in the apheresis and blood transfusion surface uh, uh, from the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and uh, um, from uh, um, uh, abroad, we, we have, we are shared with Dr. Pitti Doggett, uh, who will be uh, joining us and giving us uh, information about and, and knowledge and, and experience about single needle apheresis. Uh, I will not take much. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you all uh, participants in, in this uh, uh, webinars and I wish you all successful webinars and uh, informative. Uh, I'll ask Noor, uh, Dr. Noor al muzain uh, who is a consultant uh, hematologist and transfusion medicine, uh, uh, to uh, go through the uh, uh, opening speech for this uh, um, uh, webinars and introduce the uh, uh, chairperson. Thank you. Uh, uh, th okay, thank you, Prof. Um, uh, so today, uh, the uh, Society of Blood Disorders are uh, celebrating the Apheresis Awareness Day uh, for the second year. And the purpose of this Awareness Day is to raise awareness of uh, apheresis medicine among the different medical uh, specialties uh, through different modalities, the donor and the therapeutic, um, and to highlight the role of the apheresis uh, practitioners um, uh, in, in the medical uh, field. And to, uh, today is also special because um, uh, the Aphoresis Awareness Day is in collaboration with three different societies, uh, the SSBD and Saudi Society of Transfusion Medicine and uh, the uh, American uh, Society uh, of Aphoresis, which is the uh, 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 pioneer society in this field. Um, uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce um, Prof. Uh, uh, Salwa Handawi, um, who is also a pioneer in the field, um, to uh, uh, as a panelist for the um, for today's webinar. And thanks a lot, Prof. Salwa. Yes. Assalamu uh, alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I have the pleasure uh, to be with you as a moderator today, and I would like to thank Dr. Noor for her uh, introduction. And just, uh, I am uh, just representing Saudi Society of Transfusion Medicine uh, today, and we have the pleasure to join uh, Saudi Society for Blood Disorders in this uh, important event. Uh, we'll start uh, today to welcoming you and all the speakers, the, our distinguished speaker. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce for you the first, our first speaker, Dr. Ahmed Al Bahrani. Dr. Ahmed Al Bahrani is a consultant transfusion medicine and stem cell transplant. He is the head of stem cell transplant lab and therapeutic apheresis at King Fahad Specialized Hospital. Mm -hmm. And he had a wide range of research and he had a publication in the field. He is from Dammam, Saudi Arabia. His talk will be on the current and future use of apheresis. Please, Dr. Ahmed, you can start. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Dr. Asalwa, for the nice uh, introduction. Also, I would like to thank the Saudi Society for a blood disorder, Mohammed Dr. Uh, Firas, and also I would like to thank 
دكتوره نور ام دكتور طارق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, we are today celebrating for the 2021 afaresis awareness uh, that is uh, happened in september 21st uh, my presentation will be about the current and the future use of of afaresis Uh, this is our uh, hospital, King Fahad Specialist Hospital in Dammam. Uh, what is the definition of apheresis? Apheresis is a medical uh, technology in which uh, the blood of a person is passed through a uh, machine, apparatus, that separates out one uh, particular constitute of the blood and retain the remainder to the circulation. So it is an extra uh, corporeal uh, therapy. Uh, the blood uh, is separated uh, by centrifugal force that separates the blood cells into uh, based onto their specific gravity. Uh, as you can see here, the bottom will be the RBC, and then we have the buffy coat layer. Then on the top will be the plasma. Uh, the buffy coat is also uh, the cells are separated according to their specific gravity. The granulocyte will be at the lower, then uh, above it will be the monocyte, then the lymphocyte and the platelet. Uh, the stem cell will be somewhere between the lymphocyte and the uh, monocyte. Uh, in apheresis, the uses of apheresis is a wide range. We have donation apheresis and we have uh, therapeutic and are both equally important. Uh, with the donation apheresis, the blood is taken from a healthy donor. Uh, this blood will be separated into its component part during donation, uh, where the needed component is collected and the unused component are returned back to the uh, donor. Uh, with this type of apheresis, uh, we don't need the replacement uh, fluid. And also the apheresis donor uh, can donate the blood more frequent than those of uh, whole blood donation. This is the advantages of apheresis donation. Uh, we have different type of uh, donation by apheresis. We have platelet donation. We call it a platelet pheresis or uh, thrombocytopheresis or thrombopheresis. It is the collection of a platelet by apheresis while returning the RBC, the white cells, and the uh, plasma. Uh, the yield is normally equal to six to 10, or even 12 random platelet concentrate. Uh, the quality control demands that the platelet from the apheresis unit should be equal or more than three multiplied by 10 to power 11. And the donor can donate uh, up to 24 times uh, per year. We have also retinal donation. We call it erythrocytopheresis. It's the separation of the RBC from the whole blood uh, by donation and uh, by centrifugal force. Uh, the blood is collected and the remainder of the uh, uh, blood component are returned back to the donor. Uh, the automated RBC collection procedure for donating erythrocyte is referred to as a double unit RBC apheresis. Uh, plasma apheresis also, we can collect only plasma from the donor. Uh, it is a useful in collecting plasma for a specific blood group. Also, it has a very major role during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We call it the convalescent plasma. We can collect uh, plasma from recovered Uh, COVID-19 patient. My colleague, Dr. Ammar, I am sure will talk more about this type of donation. And also we have the source plasma fractionation, which is the commercial use of, of uh, uh, fractionating the plasma that includes the immunoglobulin products, the albumin, the plasma derivatives, and the collection of rare antibody to the RPC. Uh, the advantages of AFRES donation, we can collect multiple blood components from uh, Uh, the donor in the same session, we can collect uh, uh, RBC and the plasma, we can collect RBC and the platelet, also we can collect RBC and the platelet and the plasma, 
or we can collect platelet and the plasma. This depends on the uh, type of a product and component that is needed in the blood bank. Uh, we have a granulocyte donation, uh, granulocyte transfusion in two patients with neutropenia or with patients who have ineffective neutrophil where other therapy has failed. Uh, there is limited data to suggest the benefit of granulocyte transfusion. And uh, we have some difficulty in collecting the granulocyte from the donor that the donor needs uh, some preparation and conditioning with the steroid and GCSF. And also the shelf life of the granulocyte is very short, less than 24 hours, and it is stored at uh, room temperature. Uh, the cellular therapy and MNC donation. Um, Dr. Ahmed. Yes. Uh, sorry, but the slides are not showing. Slides are not showing. Yeah. Hey, I'm. 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 I'm.
the categorizations we have four category as per ASFA guidelines. We have category one in which the disorder for apheresis is accepted as first line therapy. We have a category two in which the apheresis is accepted as second line uh, uh, therapy. We have category three, the optimum role of apheresis is not uh, established and decision making should be individualized. And we have category four. Uh, you can see we have 29 indications fall in category one, but the majority fall in category three, 79 indications in which the optimum uh, role of apheresis is not established. Uh, there are uh, some, this is some of the important indications that fall in category one. Of course, in the top of the list is the thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, uh, sickle cell disease, acute stroke and the prophylaxis, uh, polycythemia, cutaneous T cell uh, uh, lymphoma, we can do photophoresis for them, uh, renal transplantations, AB on convertibles, and also in case of antibody mediated re uh, rejections, and also with the desensitization protocol. Uh, some of the neuro disease, we have Gulenberry syndrome and Messina gravis. And also we have some uh, uh, renal diseases such as uh, FSGS, and uh, also we have uh, uh, hyperviscosity and gamma uh, globulemia. Uh, the apheresis elements, uh, there are some important elements uh, before initiating the apheresis treatment uh, to confirm the diagnosis, uh, history of the current illness, the effect of uh, therapeutic apheresis on the comorbidity and also the medication that is given to the patient. As we know that AC inhibitors are contraindicated uh, during the therapeutic apheresis procedures. And also we have some technical issue related to the type of the anticoagulant that is used either citrate or heparin. Uh, the type of the replacement uh, solution, the vascular access is always a challenge. Uh, the volume of the whole blood to be processed, is it one volume or 1.5 volume, uh, should be all discussed and uh, uh, addressed before starting the uh, treatment. Also, the plan of the treatment is uh, the number of the uh, procedure, five procedures or seven procedures or uh, more than that. And also the frequency, uh, is it done daily or every other day? And also we should look at the, uh, some lab investigation before starting the uh, therapeutic apheresis treatment and also during monitoring of the uh, treatment. Uh, the timing uh, of initiating the treatment, either emergency, urgent, or routine, it depends on the clinical condition of the patient and also depends on the indications and also the location. Uh, can be done in the ICU, in the ward, in the OR, in the ER, and also as outpatient uh, setting. Of course, on the top of the therapeutic apheresis is the therapeutic plasma exchange, in which the blood of the patient is passed through a medical device which separates out the plasma from other components of the blood. The plasma is removed and replaced with replacement fluid, such as albumin, plasma, or uh, crystalloid solutions. Uh, this is the most common type of a treatment and also the most common use of uh, therapeutic plasma exchange is for the use for the treatment of autoimmune and immune mediated diseases or disorder. Uh, there are so many specialty involved in this type of a treatment, renal and uh, metabolic diseases, the hematological diseases and the neurological disorders. Uh, removing the plasma will, will remove the disease mediator that is circulating in the patient plasma that is include the allo antibody, the auto antibody, the immune complexes, abnormal or high level of a plasma protein, uh, very high level of cholesterol, and also high level of a plasma metabolic waste product or a plasma bound poisons or drugs. Uh, reducing the level of disease mediator can relieve symptoms, but it is not a curative. Uh, 
uh, some example of the autoantibody is the uh, anti-GBM glomerulonephritis, the good bastard syndromes, the ankanephritis, the ankavasculitis, uh, acute Gulenberry syndrome, and Messina gravis. Uh, some example of the alloantibody removal is the transplant uh, uh, desensitization protocols and also the antibody-mediated rejections treatment. Also, the red cell aluminization and RH alloimmunization in pregnancy, and also in post transfusion perbora. Baroprotein uh, removal, such as uh, uh, Walden store microglobulinemia, and also hyperviscosity in light chain in neuropathy and light chain glomerulopathy. Uh, TBE will also not only remove the plasma and the abnormal pathogens, also will remove the normal component of the plasma that includes the albumin, the fibrinogen, the coagulation factors, the electrolyte, uh, the plasma-bound drugs, and also the uh, normal immunoglobulins as well. As you can see from this diagram that with 1.5 plasma volume exchange, we are removing 78% of the disease mediator. If we go beyond uh, 1.5 plasma volume exchange, uh, the removal of the disease mediator will not be uh, so significant. Uh, before starting the treatment, we have to calculate the plasma volume of the patient by uh, knowing the patient uh, sex, the patient height, and the weight, and also to calculate the total blood volume and also from the hematocrit will calculate the uh, total plasma volume of the patient. Uh, one of the most important uh, indication that fall in category one for plasma exchange is the uh, TTB, thrombotic thrombocytopenic perbola, which is uh, considered life-saving in this uh, type of a treatment. Uh, the, also with the therapeutic apheresis, we can do uh, red blood cell exchange. It is the removal of large volume of abnormal RBC and replacement with normal uh, donor uh, red cells. Uh, uh, some of the indications are sickle cell disease, severe malaria, uh, baby, baby biosteosis, and also erythropoietic or protoporphyria and liver disease and ABO and compatible hematopoietic stem cell transplant. But of course, the sickle cell disease is the most widely used type of a treatment uh, with red cell exchange. Uh, you can see here that uh, uh, with acute stroke and sickle cell disease, it is category one. And also here for, prophylax for stroke prophylaxis uh, and sickle cell disease, the red cell exchange also category one treatment. Also, with the therapeutic apheresis, we can do uh, cellular depletion. Uh, it is a rapid reduction of a greatly elevated number of cells from the intravascular space to reduce the risk associated with the vascular stasis. Uh, supportive therapy uh, must be used in combination with, the, with this type of treatment. We can do leukocytopheresis which is the WBC depletion in cases with AML and ALL. We can do also erythrocytopheresis, which is the red cell depletion with the polycythemia vera mainly. Also, we can do a thrombocytopheresis, which is the platelet depletion with cases with a severe or marked uh, thrombocytosis. Uh, this is the ASFA guidelines indications for uh, uh, hyperleukocytosis. As you can see here, the symptomatic uh, hyperleukocytosis, it fall in category two, whereas the prophylactic, it fall in category three. With polycythemia vera, it fall in category one indication. Uh, another mode of a treatment or another type of apheresis is the lipoprotein apheresis, which is the selective removal of lipoprotein particles from the blood with the return of the remaining component. Uh, some of the indications here are the familial hypercholesterolemia, 
and the hypertriglyceridemia, pancreatitis, and the lipoprotein, hyper uh, lipoproteinemia. Uh, extracorporeal photophoresis is a therapeutic procedure in which the buffy coat is separated from the patient blood, treated extracorporeally with a photoactive compound, which is the soralin, uh, and exposed to a UV light, then uh, the product is re-infused to the patient during the same procedure. Some of the indications are cutaneous T-cell lymphoma uh, for the treatment of acute and chronic graft versus host disease uh, for uh, the cellular and recurrent rejection and cardiac transplant, and also in some dermatological disease such as psoriasis and scleroderma. Uh, the immunoabsorption is a therapeutic procedure in which the plasma of the patient after apheresis separation of the, from the blood is passed through a medical device, which is the, the column, the adsorber column, which has a capacity to remove the immunoglobulin by binding them. And we use the immunoabsorption technique with some uh, indication like the ABO and compatible renal transplant, antibody-mediated rejection, and the during desensitization protocol and also for the uh, refractory ITB and also for multiple sclerosis. What are the challenges uh, during the apheresis and therapeutic apheresis procedure? Of course, the vascular access is the main challenge that we face during our practice and uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Vitti, will uh, uh, explore more about this issue. Uh, also, the challenges is the lack of well a trained health professional, the nurses and the physicians. Uh, and also the AFRES uh, physicians are usually exposed to a multitude of uh, medical condition with a diverse of medical specialty, neurology, hematology, nephrology, and also with the pediatric patient and adult type of patient and also with sometime in units. Uh, one of the major challenges in uh, the practice of therapeutic apheresis is, is the uh, 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 shortages of clinical trials. Many of the therapeutic apheresis indications were categorized as optimal uh, role of apheresis is not uh, yet established, which is category three. Uh, so we need more clinical trial uh, on those type of indications. Uh, what are the barriers to the clinical trial? Many of the disorders we treat are rare. It is often quite difficult also to recruit patients uh, to the clinical trial. Uh, we need multi-center trials, also difficulty to find uh, other co-investigator interested uh, to support the trial. And also one of the barriers in the clinical trial in therapeutic apheresis is, is the uh, difficulty of funding from the industrial and also from the national institutes. Uh, the animal models and apheresis, um, it's also difficult, you know, and uh, sometimes not uh, uh, have a, a lot of relevance. Uh, apheresis is also frequently used in acute settings, which is make also the clinical trial and to recruit uh, patients is also uh, difficult. So in conclusion, the ASFA uh, guidelines continue to provide apheresis prescribers and user up-to-date recommendation for the use of therapeutic apheresis based on the latest published literature available. And since the introduction of apheresis uh, technology, there has been an increase in the contributing indication for therapeutic apheresis, and still there are a lot of opportunities for therapeutic apheresis to expand in the future. Uh, the latest uh, edition of the ASFA guidelines have 84 fact sheets for relevant diseases and medical condition with 157 uh, graded and categorized indications. Uh, also, uh, what is needed are well-designed, controlled clinical trials in the field of uh, therapeutic apheresis. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this uh, interesting presentation and comprehensive presentation on apheresis. Uh, we uh, just I want to remind everyone that if you can write your question at the questions and answer icon to the right, and at the end of the session, we will have answers and uh, for all the, your questions and the panel discussion. Now I have the pleasure to introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker is Dr. Ammar Sawyer. Um, Dr. Ammar is the chairman of transfusion uh, services at the uh, Department of King Fahad Medical City, Dammam. He's also a consultant in transfusion medicine in the Department of Hematology and Pathology and Clinical Laboratory. He has a wide range also of uh, researches and publication. Uh, Dr. Ammar will talk today about apheresis during the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Ammar. Please, you can just share your slide and start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Salwa, for this uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and the SSBD and Dr. Firas Al-Freyh, Dr. Tariq Awaida, and Dr. Noor for their efforts on this seminar, and especially Dr. Salwa for uh, chairing this session. And uh, one minor correction, I am uh, working in King Fahad Medical City and uh, the second Riyadh cluster in Riyadh, uh, not in Dammam. Uh, but it is very uh, pleasure to work in them. Oh, yes, yes, it is in Riyadh. Yes, thank you. Yes, Riyadh. Um, my presentation today will be about the apheresis uh, medicine. And uh, I would like to also to thank Dr. Ahmed for making my life easy in this presentation because he touched many uh, therapeutic and donor issues that I will just briefly go over them. Uh, this is uh, very good from Dr. Ahmed also. My presentation today will be about apheresis. Is it shared or not? Do you see my slide? Yes, yes, we can see it, slides. Thank you. So uh, apheresis medicine during the pandemic, and when we talk about the pandemic, we talk about from the right before the curfew, right from beginning of uh, 2020 until now, we are still uh, suffering from the consequences of this pandemic uh, about many things and the uncertainty we see in many things. We we have uncertainty and we have effects of the disease, effects of the uh, vaccine and this consequent, uh, we have a lot of impact on our uh, blood supply and our uh, uh, practice. So uh, do you, in, my, in my presentation, I'll be touching, this is my uh, facility, Confed Medical City in Riyadh, and I will be give a brief introduction about the disease and apheresis and about, about the blood supply during the uh, pandemic and the effect of pandemic on the apheresis medicine and how the apheresis medicine helped to combat, to combat this disease. And the, we'll talk about the COVID plasma uh, at the end of the presentation. As Dr. Ahmed uh, elaborated a lot on this uh, apheresis, it is a, a method of obtaining one particular component from the uh, blood and retaining the rest to the patient or to the donor. And we can remove uh, this. There is a donor application and therapeutic patient and therapeutic application. We can remove plasma, we can remove cellular components, we can remove platelets, and many wide uh, applications, as Dr. Ahmed said. But uh, the COVID-19 and SAR, the COVID-19 has impacted a lot to the uh, blood supply, either directly or indirectly. The, there is a fear and uh, in our practice, we always talked about the, uh, what uh, a new uh, viral agent will have an impact on the uh, blood supply. And uh, we were uh, studying this a lot. And now we face this issue with the COVID-19. I remind you that COVID-19 is a highly infectious uh, particle. It is uh, not known to be transmitted by blood transfusion, but this is not yet certain. And it, the, the, there is no significant viremia in the asymptomatic person. So there is no, a, a lot of need to test the blood for these, but uh, um, the donor history is very important. But this, with all this, we have to have uh, additional, uh, we have to apply the precautionary principle and measures and minimize the risk of transfusion uh, from donor to the donor, uh, from donor to patient, from donor to uh, staff, from staff to donors. So this uh, is very uh, important uh, that happened over the past year. And there was uh, the, the public confidence uh, was shaken in, initially um, in the beginning of the pandemic. 
and why this is many donors elect not to give blood uh, during this, uh, especially in the first six months of disease. Uh, as I said, we, uh, as, as a phoresis medicine, part of transfusion medicine, and uh, blood is very essential in, um, in, in, in the management of many diseases. And this blood will come from healthy donors. And uh, this, uh, the, during the COVID-19, many operations, when I, when I talk about hospital operations, have been canceled. Not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about uh, surgical operations, but business, as usual, is reduced. But the need for blood continues to be, to be there. And we, as blood suppliers, we were charged to maintain this blood uh, supply. But Remember that many scheduled uh, appointments and uh, blood drives and uh, uh, campaigns were canceled. And this, in which we rely a lot on the campaigns and voluntary donors. So uh, the percentage, the, the, the amount of blood available to the uh, patients were uh, reduced. Another, this is beside, um, uh, then another risk came from the, the public. Will I get COVID-19 at the blood with, uh, dur when, during my visit to the hospital when many patients are there uh, and um, many people are advised to stay home. So this is posed a lot to another risk, another burden to the blood supplier. This is the, when, as I said, when I talk about the pandemic, this is a continuous event from uh, early 2020 until, uh, until now. The, uh, the COVID-19 has, as you said, take the first, uh, this is 2020, blue is 19, orange is 2020. In the first quarter, you see that the numbers of uh, collections are reduced. Uh, and also the, um, but as the curve goes down, we start, there's a circuit breaker here at uh, almost April 20. Uh, 20, where interventions, we start to have our interventions to maintain the blood supply to the community. As you see, the demand continues um, and the usage continues with marginal difference between the 19 and 20. So this is early in the beginning of the pandemic in China, the, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on blood centers. And right from the beginning, the, the, uh, the, uh, the issues were highlighted. And the, uh, there was a lot, uh, there is, of course, there is reduction in the number of donors and supply and the campaigns. The, uh, most of, in, in this survey, uh, most of the donors, they uh, are not willing to donate blood uh, by, by 96%. And the main, reason was fear of infection by visiting the hospital, followed by, um, uh, you, you know, um, weaken, weakening of their immune response if they give a blood and the antibodies drop. Uh, and they advise all these measures uh, to combat the disease and regain, and regain the confidence of the, um, the public. As a blood supplier, and uh, we have um, many many missions, and and during this pandemic, uh, beside collecting the blood, the public were um, uh, uncertain about their confidence was shaked on the blood uh, system and the blood donation, whether it is safe or not. So we have to uh, we have to regain their confidence on this uh, issue, and also to minimize the risk of COVID-19 uh, transmission during the donation process from uh, donor to recipient, from donor to patient, to staff and from staff to donor. So we want, we would, we are, our mission to secure sustainable blood supply during this past years, uh, because there are many patients still needs the, uh, the blood, uh, hematological blood diseases, uh, oncologic patients, uh, organ and um, bone marrow transplants, emergency and traumas. These, they didn't stop in the past year, years. So the integrity of a blood supply have to be maintained. When we talk about integrity, we, have, we are responsible of the safety of blood supply. We want to have it as, as safe as possible and zero deficiency and availability of blood to the, uh, to the community. Despite, so what if the blood, uh, would, if this left un, uh, unintervened, maybe you know, the number of donors would reduce. So we took extra measures to, uh, to protect the recipient, to protect the donors, and to protect the staff, and to secure the blood supply. 
reassurance of the community or uh, reduce the anxiety um, fear about the donation being transparent clear and effective communication between uh, the, uh, the to the community uh, continuous media and donor engagement use of social media uh, and all this to regain and or secure the blood supply measures every every blood center uh, since the pandemic they start to apply uh, many many measures to protect the staff and donors uh, reinforce self deferral um, uh, pre screening for donors at the entry of the uh, blood center check for fever uh, safe distancing uh, in the in, set, in the waiting areas uh, planning and co crowd control uh, use of applications to schedule to have very good scheduling system and also um, measures to protect the staff uh, temperature checking for the staff team segregation um, wear, mask wearing mandatory mask wearing for all the patient and donors for donors and staff and anybody who has any suspicion of uh, infection uh, mandatory leave and stay home this was applied uh, right from the beginning uh, there is all, these are measures we take to increase the collection in the face of cancellations of many campaigns, reassurance, uh, SMS sent to many, to mass SMS sent to many donors, organizers, approaching organizers to uh, re or, or organize another campaigns, uh, uh, recruitment, uh, encourage scheduling of appointments, online appointment scheduling, what team platform helped a lot in the uh, in the pandemic in our country. Uh, other measures to uh, meet transfusion demand, we, we talk about increasing supply, now we have to control the transfusion, uh, the unnecessary transfusions, uh, advocate the use of alternative measures in transfusion, uh, apply um, transfusion, apply uh, very strict uh, transfusion guidelines, reduce non-emergency services, the postponed of non-urgent uh, elective surgeries, and importantly, is the uh, optimization of donor affiliates uh, uh, for donors. And here, the donor affiliates, as Dr. did mention, we have we have to we did we know that the, the we needed a special products that have short expiry. We needed we know that we need uh, um, products uh, in over short time. So the donor the affiliates medicine help in this uh, particular area by collecting platelet and backed RBC plasma or stem cells. The, uh, the the platelets, uh, as you as you know, the one single aphoresis donor um, is equal to six random, uh, and one unit backed RBC uh, collected by aphoresis is, uh, is high, very high quality. Collected, uh, for, for example, if we needed negative blood group or a special uh, precious product, for aphoresis donors. Remind you that donor may donate single or double or triple products. Single, single equal to six, double, 12, triple, 18 units at one time. And we have the privilege of um, uh, having this donor donated at least maximum 24 per year, uh, twice, per, twice per week, um, with two days apart. So this is give us very good leverage in, uh, in, this, uh, in this particular aspect. Same for uh, back to RBC, uh, one unit or double unit with applying the deferral uh, six to eight weeks or 16 weeks, especially in uh, precious products. Uh, the, we have another privilege in using the aphoresis is that we have con multiple components can be collected from a single aphoresis donor, which we, uh, and very high quality product, platelet or plasma, RBC and plasma, uh, and so on. There is an impact of the uh, disease on uh, of the pandemic over on the uh, therapeutic apheresis. Uh, as Dr. Ahmed, he mentioned many application therapeutic uh, apheresis. These are some. And in one particular study that looked at the impact of COVID-19 and the, um, the activity of therapeutic apheresis, they're very similar to our practice, uh, uh, you know, large center like ours in, uh, in the country. Um, where the um, the number of number of procedures and number of patients were reduced, the, um, the there was a significant reduction in the total number of patients and in procedures by sixteen and seventeen percent. 
but uh, there is some differences. The, uh, for example, the chronic, for example, therapeutic aphidesis, chronically treated uh, uh, diseases where maybe they were, they may be uh, canceled, and the physician may elect to cancel the procedure and may use alternative therapies. Uh, but acute uh, incidences were unchanged. There is no observed reduction in the autologous stem cell collection. Uh, this is expected. The allogenic uh, transplant were reduced uh, in, uh, during the pandemic in this particular study. Then comes the, uh, co the use of convalescent plasma for um, uh, COVID-19. Right from the beginning, the FDA issued the, uh, this emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma. Uh, utilizing the background information about the use of plasma in MERS uh, before. So they, they said, why not to use it in this uh, particular, by particular disease? So our, our groups in, uh, in the country also immediately, they uh, uh, developed this uh, KSA, pla the plasma study for uh, COVID-19. And most of us were, part most of us here in the, uh, audience and um, they participated in this study and contributed hugely to the success of this uh, uh, kingdom-wide uh, study. But uh, preparing one patient for uh, one donor for COVID-19 to give uh, two patients uh, uh, to prepare to collect two doses this is a very cumbersome duty and job. And uh, when the management of one donor equal in terms of hours um, to uh, um, like managing maybe 20 uh, whole blood donors. The The, the, we did um, establish donor recruitment plan for these uh, donors at the level of MOH and it went down to the hospitals. We get the list from recovered patients from the uh, MOH and uh, we, we did call the donors to uh, come and donate. And there was some appeals. Uh, the appeals internationally was very strong locally. Uh, you know, just above average public to we call public were called to uh, recruit these donors to uh, visit the nearest uh, study sites. <coughs> um, the donor eligibility and criteria is that the donors must be uh, meet all the allergenic uh, donor criteria. Uh, the, 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 the has he has to be documented uh, COVID nineteen positive and became COVID nineteen negative and recovered from the disease. And the, the males were preferred and females also, uh, if not uh, pregnant. This is a snapshot of the, uh, how the process overall get we, the patient in red, he recovered and then we test him for the antibody. And if it become, uh, if, if, he, if he is um, um, recruited, then we test for the antibody positive, then we uh, plasma freeze him, uh, which collect almost 600. Part of the study to subject it to pathogen reduction and then divided into two doses and uh, uh, stock, stock it in our inventory for any needy patients. The, the, this Saudi plasma study, uh, it was meant to test the feasibility and providing this uh, option to these patients and assess the safety and efficacy of convalescent plasma as a therapeutic option in these uh, cohort of patients. <clears throat> uh, the, the study uh, had 12, 22 sites, uh, academic and non-academic, and the, uh, there were no death-related uh, plasma infusions, and the study was matched for a gender um, diabetes mediated hypertension and with a need, whether there is a need for intubation. We did recruit uh, 1,078 uh, uh, donors and uh, almost 214 uh, recipients uh, with the, almost 800 comparative. In our center, we did collect, we did recruit almost 70, uh, 70 
Um, we have almost 70 uh, recipients uh, in Kinfan Medical City. This is comparison of the uh, distribution match for variables between convalescent plasma recipient and the comparator patients. Um, males were more, uh, they have uh, uh, the comorbidities, diabetes and hypertension is uh, in, six, in 38 to 45%. And uh, uh, overall, 63 patients required uh, uh, intubation and the CV recipients similar percentage. <clears throat> Safety outcome compared between the uh, um, uh, the, the groups, uh, the hospital length of stay almost similar, not significant p value. IC length of stay is also um, very close. Most of these in the intubation were not significant p value. This is the survival probability between the the group and the uh, uh, comparators. And the, from this from this graph, you see that. Uh, uh, the graph for the CB patients is better. Same for uh, the 30 day survival probability for these uh, patients require ICU admission. 59% patients would meet in severe criteria. So the effect of uh, convalescent plasma transfusion to the length of stay um, was not found to be uh, significant. There might be, a, 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 this is possibly due to multiple risk factors and confounding variables uh, uh, for the disease. Uh, the majority of patient treatment with all other, uh, uh, you know, interventions were done before uh, they opt to uh, convalescent plasma. So there is a selection of high risk patients or selection bias. Uh, despite the study uh, limitation there was, in, yeah, you know, the, the, the believe that the result provides scientific basis to support the use of convalescent plasma. The uh, was found to be the convalescent plasma was found to be safe if given in more than 300 ml. Um, the effect of convalescent plasma transfusion to the lymph stay was not significant. Mortal there is a mortality benefit for patients receiving uh, convalescent plasma. Uh, earlier CB infusion at first signs of respiratory may be better. Patients who are not category of life threatening, or they don't seem those at critical severe cases, they don't seem to be benefiting. And this is the um, uh, the, the the great summary findings for, for convalescent plasma worldwide, published by uh, CMAG. And uh, oh, uh, you, you cannot read it, but uh, and I, the most of the uh, conclusions in these number of studies, they said that convalescent plasma may have. Uh, benefit may have a role in um, in combating COVID-19 disease, most of them. My last slide and conclusion, um, convalescent uh, apheresis medicine and technologies are um, very, uh, very, uh, uh, very important, very useful technologies that uh, help the, the, um, the medical practice. They were very integral in this um, pandemic disease uh, um, combat because they were very crucial in securing the blood supply by, um, you know, having the privilege of uh, um, special ability to collect specialized high quality products uh, over a short time, and also provide therapeutic option uh, for the, the the disease like convalescent plasma. Uh, the, from the studies and also um, the, the, they were imp the, the, the impact by the pandemic was uh, marginal um, because they were, we were able to reorganize our service and re, uh, re, uh, rebrand or uh, we, we, we have other businesses to do in the disease itself. Um, as it have a great impact on a pandemic combat <clears throat> uh, whether at the, at the donor level or at the therapeutic level. With this, I would like to thank you all for listening and uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ammar, for this uh, important and excellent presentation on apheresis during COVID-19 pandemic locally. And uh, we'll keep question to the end. And now I have the pleasure to introduce our last guest speaker, Ms. Betty Doggett. Ms. Betty Doggett, she is um, an apheresis certified apheresis technician and she had received her qualification in apheresis from the American Society of Clinical Pathology. She's the American Society of Apheresis Board of Director Vice President. 
and she had also, um, she is the developer of the Aphresis mobile application called Aphresis Professionals on the go and Aphresis blog. And she is having experience over 25 years on Aphresis, donation Aphresis and therapeutic Aphresis. Welcome, uh, Miss Betty. And she will talk today on single needle Aphresis. Uh, you can start, please. Um, just. Yes. Well, thank Can you very much. Welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today to speak. Um, I think you all are able to view my slides. Am I correct? Okay. Yes. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. It's okay. Perfect. Great. So today I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk to you about single needle apheresis um, for therapeutic plasma exchange. Next slide, please. Next slide. You can't control it from your side. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, there we go. So yeah, so this is uh, covering the single needle um, for apheresis using uh, the therapeutic plasma exchanges. And this was just a single institution's experience. Um, next slide, please. During this presentation today, I have no conflicts of interest and I have no conflicts in relation to this study. So when we first implemented this, um, before I go into the slide that you see in front of you, I wanna talk a, a minute about what we did to get this up and going. Um, we did like a little small mock run um, using blood to just um, see if the procedure could really be done. And if it would really work, um, we made up some fictitious numbers and we documented all the run values. We documented all the steps of the procedure um, to see if it would actually work. So leading up to this first slide, um, once we did that, we came back, the information was presented the medical director was on board with us doing this. So we sought out patients. And in the midst, of, once we sought the patients out, um, at the time that the patients would come in, um, there was the initial consult. And whether they were inpatient or outpatient, whether it was on an emergency or non-emergency basis, A vein assessment. On that vein assessment, we would determine um, if the patient needed to have a central venous catheter placed. Um, since normally with apheresis procedures, you do need two peripheral veins, and peripheral access is the preferred method. Next slide. Next slide. So with that being said, um, we found that that terminal BCT did offer an alternative and the alternative was the use of the single needle for plasma exchange treatments. This is a, it, it is a discontinuous flow um, that is used and it's done on just the one single needle, which I'll show you a little later on, but it's used to draw and return. And this procedure could be used with patients that only have one adequate vein, or if they have a single lumen 
access device, you have the ability to use this procedure as well. So in December um, of 2015, um, the, the procedure was offered to patients with one uh, adequate vein, patients that had two adequate veins, but sometimes those patients wished to alternate between sites. Um, and then of course, there were the patients that had the single lumen access device. Um, and there were some that had a tidal port. Um, the patients were advised that the procedure run times could be approximately 30 to 45 minutes longer um, compared to the dual needle TPE. Um, patients complete, a survey was created um, for patients uh, undergoing the single needle treatment, and they completed the questionnaire regarding their experience um, with this new option at the end of every procedure as part of a quality improvement project. Next slide. On this next slide, I'm not um, here on the actual Optia instrument um, in your dis on your display screen. Um, this just tells you if you want to use this option exactly where to go. So you would go to your uh, run screen and this is what it looks like. And at the bottom, it tells you on the bottom left, it tells you whether you're in single needle or if you're in dual needle. And you can see where it says yes. Next screen. And then from there, you have your options. You, su you select, your, select your yes and you select continue in order to proceed. So this is what the actual single needle connector looks like. I've, I've been questioned on whether you could use a, a Y connector from somewhere else. Um, that is left up to the discretion of your facility, my preference, and my suggestion would always be to go with the manufacturer. Um, this is just the one additional piece that you need to get this procedure up and running. This is a lure, a male lure connection, and it has the male and the female. The return line goes on the bottom and the access line goes on the top. And that is designed to prevent recirculation. Next slide, please. So as you attach, and when you're attaching the connector, um, if you look on the Optia, on the display screen, it is telling you, it's also providing you the picture to tell you exactly how to connect, where to connect, connect it. Um, on the screen, you see that there's your access line and there's your return line and the system prompts you and walks you through the steps. So on the next screen, when you're monitoring your procedure, um, you will always know when you're in the single needle mode because on the screen, it will tell you um, as you're monitoring Next slide, please. 
it will also tell you when you're monitoring um, the single needle versus dual needle because you'll see the little adapter up in the left hand corner of your display screen along with all the, the rest of your procedural parameters. Next slide, please. So basically the purpose of this study was to evaluate um, patient satisfaction with this option. We also wanted to assess other outcomes, the flow rate um, during the procedure, the run times, if there would, were or would there be any adverse reactions. Um, and during that time, um, we looked at uh, charts. We started a retro pers uh, per perspective patient chart review. And it went from December of 2015 to August of 2016. And the comparison, as you see here, of flow rates run times the plasma removal efficiency. Um, everything was pretty much um, within the same range. There was no significant um, observations between the two procedures. Um, the run times, you know, plus that plus or minus that 30 to 45 minutes, um, everything else was still the same. Um, as far as the patients, uh, the patients uh, did fine. They tolerated the procedure very well. We had five patients to undergo um, a, a total of 68 treatments. Next slide. Um, and of those uh, five patients, three were male and two were females. Their ages range from 40 to 63. And they all had different, um, they were all diagnosed um, differently. And all five of those patients as well had previously undergone plasma exchange treatments. And uh, there was only one patient that um, we did lose access and she did require having, um, having to have a port placed. But nevertheless, these five patients did extremely well in the midst of the procedures. Um, we didn't have any issues. Um, next slide, please. So this is just um, when I talked about the run times, the values, this is just a table that displays the and breaks down the five patients information. So if you want to go back and look at this at a later date, um, you're free to do so. With the single needle uh, procedure, the cycles, um, they go very quickly. So they, it's almost like a matter of seconds. So for three to five seconds, you're in run three to five seconds, you're in draw, and this is just done until the procedure is complete. But this, um, this chart here, this table, just provides you with uh, low demographics and some dual needle information versus the single needle information. So for um, run times, flow times, and adverse reactions. Um, the procedure run times, they vary 
from 90 minutes to 163 minutes. Um, flow rates were very similar, as I stated earlier. When we mm, did the mock run, we uh, got up to 100 mils per minute. But then while we were in the midst of doing this study, um, we were able to get up to 110 mils per min um, for a flow rate without any issues. Um, none of the patients needed calcium. Um, there was no increase in citrate reactions and everything just flowed very well. And this is just another chart that breaks down the comparison of the run times, uh, your dual needle versus your single needle and patient one, their average run time um, for a dual needle was 119 minutes. Then for a single needle, there's that additional 54 minutes and same thing throughout the rest. Um, and there was one that lasted that 37 minutes longer. And if I'm not mistaken, that was the patient that um, we had issues with and um, had to get, wind up having to get the port. So for the patient satisfaction survey that um, we created and, and gave to our patients, it was a very small survey, very simple, um, very direct, and um, we, we received very high marks, which I had no doubt that we wouldn't, but the questions were just very simple. Would you consider um, using this for all your treatments? You know, would you recommend this to someone else? Did you feel comfortable? Um, was the time spent? too long, um, you know, and did you schedule your next appointment using the single needle? Because that question I thought was really important because if you schedule your next one, then when it comes to staffing issues, um, that alerts the staff that you're gonna require this machine a little longer, um, you'll be in the clinic a little longer, and um, the, the clinic and the staff may have to adjust their schedule to be able to accommodate you. So as far as patient's reasons for scheduling um, the single needle procedure, um, there were quite a few that said that they um, don't have good veins a lot of patients stated that they didn't like being stuck more than once, which was very understandable. And um, a lot of patients just liked having the option to use one arm and have an arm free during their procedures. So to continue on for satisfaction and safety, um, patients did like the single needle treatment option, despite the increased uh, in runtime. Some advantages of the single needle option that um, really stand out is that this reduces the number of vena punctures that a patient could possibly have. Also, this avoids um, placement of a central venous catheter and reduce the risk of collapse, um, central line associated bloodstream infection due to having the line. And then you, it, where it, you would extend the duration of the patient's veins because you would give them the option to switch and rotate between arms. 
So they're not using that same vein every time they come in. So, um, you know, when this was done, um, this was done because the, you know, our service was to continue to offer this option to improve and promote patient um, satisfaction and patient safety. And although I'm no longer at this institution, um, you know, the, the, I know that this is something that they're ve ve very, very big on, which is promoting patient safety and satisfaction. So I have no doubt that they're continuing with this process. Next slide. So overall, the uh, patient satisfaction um, was uh, really great. Um, we received high marks, 10 out of 10, which I, I don't think you can go uh, get in any higher than that, which was really great. And um, so in, in conclusion, um, in this study, we did find that the single TPE operates very similar to the dual. Um, it's similar with the flow rates, the plasma removal efficiency, um, as far as citrate reactions, um, but it does increase the runtime. So as, as long as you're relaying that message to your patient, this is an option that you can offer. Patient satisfaction with this option, like I said, was extremely high. Um, once again, you know, this alternative does offer patients that have one vein or one access um, device the option to do this treatment. And then I'll go as far to say, in the event that there, you have an, a patient that is urgent and you have to do this on an emergency basis, um, if you're having a problem trying to get the patient in to get their line, um, you can go ahead, you know, find that one vein, get them up and going, get their procedure going, and they may have to get a line the next day or they may be, they don't want a line at all. So this is just a list of uh, my references. Next slide. And more references. And if you wish to cite this article, um, here's the information to do so. And I would like to take the time to send a special thanks to the American Society of Apheresis. Um, to the Saudi Society for Blood Disorders and the co-authors from UT Southwestern Medical Center that contributed to this publication and everyone that is participating in Apheresis Awareness Day for making this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Betty. Uh, it was um, very nice uh, coverage. And this, um, uh, we need to say here that you were the developer of this single uh, needle for the therapeutic apheresis patient. Uh, and uh, your study was um, an excellent uh, you know, opportunity for patients to start having um, you know, one or single apheresis without um, doing the central line, if it's possible to use the single line. 
um, referral line. This is excellent and thank you for that. Uh, we hope that we can just use it for our patients. We usually do the one which is um, uh, central. We always put the central line and start with our patients. Uh, only a few patients who are uh, just have hypercholesterolemia and we can do it uh, at daycare. We just do uh, apheresis from the peripheral uh, line. Thank you very much. Uh, now we can just start um, the panel discussion and we can ask all the speakers. Uh, we have a lot of questions here. We try to choose a few questions which we can let all speakers join us for that. Um, I may just direct a question to one of you, but anyone can answer. Um, the first question was, um, maybe can be for Dr. Ahmed, uh, the contraindication of apheresis. One of the audience want to know what is contraindication for apheresis procedure? Uh, very important question. Shukran. Thank you, Dr. Selva, for the... Uh, the uh, of course, our purpose is to, to run a safe procedure. So before starting the procedure, we have to know the CBC, the coagulation status of the patient, the uh, calcium level, the fibrinogen level. Uh, so we have to maintain the intra-procedure hematocrit and hemoglobin uh, more than seven uh, throughout the procedure. And also we should take care about the uh, extracorporeal volume during running the procedure, uh, especially in the pediatric age group. Of course, the um, medication that is contraindicated uh, throughout the therapeutic apheresis treatment is, are the ACE inhibitors. Uh, so must be stopped uh, at least uh, 24 to 48 hours before initiating the treatment and uh, throughout the whole uh, treatment of therapeutic apheresis. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, if any more comments from speaker or we can just go to the second question. Uh, maybe Dr. Ammar can answer this question um, that if the donor has COVID-19 and he recovered, when he can donate uh, blood or donate any plasma, when he can be eligible for donation? Dr. Ammar, we can't hear you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. The deferral guidelines started, the history started with 30 days deferral, then went to 14 days deferral post recovery of uh, COVID 19. Uh, this applies to whole blood and to uh, plasma also, I will say. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ammar. Um, there is few centers um, also making it up to 10 days after for no, recovery. No, no. Uh, it can be from 10 days to 14 days usually, mm -hmm. but after full recovery, uh, it's not mandated to do the COVID-19 testing uh, or PCR testing Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Uh, okay, there is more questions, although, um, okay, we can just read the questions. Um, does convalescence plasma transfusion make prolonged immunity and protect you from next COVID infection? It's a nice question. This is for all, anyone can answer and then we can just discuss it. The antibodies in the plasma is uh, short life. And um, uh, if you give it, we are talking theoretically, you know, um, we know that the, 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 the antibody level drops with time. Uh, and if you are talking about uh, the patient donor, you know, and it is for the same patient donor, this is his own antibodies. Um, it might protect him for some time, but the immunity for uh, co against COVID-19 is not, not yet known. Is it humoral immunity or cell-mediated immunity also? We'll assume it is both. Uh, for giving plasma to other people, to patients uh, who have... Uh, COVID-19, uh, the study shows it might help, maybe help, maybe not. Uh, we have to differentiate plasma for whom? For your own, for the uh, recipient. 
Indeed. Yes, um, I think, yes, you are right. Um, also, um, if you mean by your question um, that if the patient already recovered and he want to get plasma, not to get again COVID, um, they still now uh, under study and uh, that you can use. And there is some of the experts saying that you can use plasma as prophylaxis for certain patients, uh, category of patients who can't get the vaccine. Uh, if we didn't use it or nobody, I think, use it for patient who recovered that to give him plasma and he can't get uh, again the COVID-19. Nobody can guarantee even with the vaccine that you can get COVID-19 again or not. Um, plasma can be used in early uh, disease or uh, it can be used as prophylaxis and it can support and help patients. Um, okay, there, there is question, I think, um, uh, questions to uh, Betty, yes. Miss Betty, there is question, is better to use central line than peripheral line for TBE? What's your uh, answer for that? Well, peripheral access, is the preferred method. Um, if you can have your patients come in for vein evaluation, if it's possible, prior to their procedure, and then you can take a look at their veins. Um, I just, if, if you don't have to have a central line and you have an adequate vein, I would say use it. I mean, peripheral access is the preferred method. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question, maybe Dr. Ahmed again, we can go. They are saying, or all of you, they are saying, what is the guideline you follow to classify diseases for therapeutic apheresis? It is asked for guidance, yes, anybody can answer what guideline and how they can receive this guideline or get it. They need to know about this. Um, the guidelines are through ASPA and I think if you are a member of ASPA, you have access to those guidelines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the answer for that question that uh, it is as for guidelines, which everybody just depend on um, and uh, expert yes, opinion also, but as for guidelines is the one which we are following. Uh, there is another question. What are the aphoresis grades? I'm not sure what this question mean. If any one of you can answer, what are the aphoresis grades? Maybe they refer to the categories Dr. Ahmed uh, talked about. Maybe. Category one, two, three, four. Maybe is this what they mean, um, grades or it's a category? I think so. This is the only thing we have. Mm -hmm. And what? what is I think the grade of evidence. The grades are they referring to? Evidence. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, Level I, of evidence? Mm -hmm. Not clear. Be a little more specific. Uh, there is one question also um, uh, for COVID convalescence plasma. How many mils they can donate? They uh, can donate up to 600 ml at one uh, setting, uh, which can be divided into uh, two doses mm -hmm. or, or more. 200 ml, the FDA, the minimum dose volume was 200 ml by the FDA, uh, but uh, maximum we can collect is 600 by apheresis, yes. uh, but we can get it also from whole blood donation sometimes. Uh, usually, and most of the centers internationally using uh, 600 ml uh, donation, mm -hmm. But there is few centers, maybe at the start, they were using up to 800 mils donation and from certain donors. Uh, usually it's 600 and usually it's divided to three uh, units to be used for patients, uh, 200 mils each unit. And it can be divided to two, as uh, Dr. Ammar said. Um, for uh, another question, it is for Dr. Ammar specifically. 
uh, do you think plasma apheresis or plasma exchange is better for COVID-19 than transfusion of CCB? Thank you. This is from Asauri. Yes. Thank you, Asauri. Yes. Well, there were um, no studies uh, who, you know, um, uh, that looked at, the, at this uh, particular issue. Um, because maybe possibly due to technical uh, and th the procedural issues and uh, patient and uh, uh, have to start the procedure in a COVID uh, positive, uh, maybe local guidelines uh, that uh, didn't encourage these things. But uh, uh, I cannot compare between something that we had and uh, something um, already started uh, and uh, there is, it shows some evidence with our high uh, weak or strong evidence. Um, some uh, at one stage of the disease where they have some um, uh, metabolites and uh, um, uh, um, chemo you know chemical cytokines and others, maybe theoretically it is uh, um, to remove to do plasma exchange to remove these cytokines uh, um, uh, and reduce the disease intensity. Uh, this is a, you are now managing the complication of the disease. COVID-19, you are trying to boost the immunity to fight uh, the disease. There are two, the principles are different in the two entities, uh, I guess. And uh, to some, I, I cannot compare between uh, both, really. Yes, you are right, Dr. Ammar. It's not a comparison uh, for between two. Either to use one of them or to use both together, and it's been tried. And we are also locally tried apheresis, therapeutic apheresis for patients with COVID-19 with some success, uh, especially with ICU patient uh, for cytokine storm. And you can use uh, the plasma, convalescence plasma after you finish from therapeutic apheresis uh, as a booster dose, and it can help also. Um, there is different uh, opinion and different experience worldwide on uh, experiment on these two and researches on these two. There's no uh, uh, published clear uh, controlled randomized trial on apheresis till now, although I know that there is some going on, but uh, till now we didn't get the results of uh, therapeutic apheresis with convalescence plasma use uh, after doing the procedure, because you can't use it for the procedure, um, the whole procedure, it would be a lot of amount of convalescence plasma and we don't usually everywhere having a, a enough donors for convalescence plasma, but we can use both with some success. Um, thank you for your question. There is a question from Muhammad, he is saying, I think this is for Ms. Betty. How can we control the ECV or extracorporeal volume? Um, for, for your procedure? Yes. We think yes, mm -hmm. for the procedure uh, in general, how you can control the extracorporeal volume. I think uh, I, I will leave you to answer and... Uh, Uh, we can't hear you if you are answering. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, basically, when you put in your parameters, your sex height and weight, your machine is going to come back with some parameters to begin with. Um, if, if you know, you con controlling your fluid balance um you just want to watch um your patient before you put them on the machine you want to watch their vitals especially if they're having blood pressure if issues and fluid shifts um you can manage your ac through the system and um, on the Optia, while it's managing the AC, if you're going to start running at higher flow rates, um, then you really want to keep an eye on your patient. Um, I, I would say 
you know, to err on the side of caution and use flow rates that's best for your patient, that your patient will tolerate. You know, and I'll give you an example. I wouldn't run a, a patient that's 125 pounds at 100 mils per minute. You, you know, you're asking for for issue. You know, so you you always want to look at what's best for your patient. But like I said, once you put in the parameters, the the opti is gonna come back um, with what is that safety range for your patient. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another questions. Uh, many questions. I can just uh, just take choose few of them. What are the deferral of donor guidelines for COVID nineteen vaccinated donors? The one who received vaccine when he can donate. Who want, who would like to answer? Um, Doctor Amar, or you want me to answer, or what? What? Yeah, uh, it depends on the vaccine. Uh, the um, available vaccines now, there is no deferral for Astra and for uh, um, uh, Pfizer. Maybe Moderna, there is a deferral period, um, maybe two weeks, as I remember. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's depend on the vaccine. If it is uh, life attenuated vaccines, or if it is messenger RNA vaccine, doesn't need any deferral. But if it's life attenuated, it's need two weeks and it's different from vaccine to vaccine. We should know what kind of vaccine the donor get that we can apply um, the usual criteria of vaccination on it. Um, thank you, Dr. Ammar. Um, there is, okay, what is this? When do I use RCE as a treatment protocol for sickle cell disease? Okay. Who I would like to answer, Dr. Ahmed or Dr. Uh, what is the question, Dr. Asadwa? Um, Najwa, she's writing, when do I use RCE exchange, red cell exchange, as treatment protocol for sickle cell disease? The red cell exchange, yeah. when we she can use it. Well, I mentioned in my presentation that uh, RBC exchange for sickle cell disease, especially for acute stroke and for stroke prophylaxis, it is uh, indicated as category one, first line treatment uh, uh, for stroke. Uh, for other type of uh, uh, clinical presentation for sickle cell disease, it depends, you know, mostly category two, but for uh, pre-op preparation, uh, it fall in category three. So it's just case by case management. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yes. The guideline. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There is another question. Uh, is it possible to give any blood component during therapeutic apheresis or it's better to give it before or after the procedure? During the exchange itself, we use replacement fluid, which is either FFP or uh, during red cell exchange, we use RBC. So we are using the blood component during the procedure itself. But if we want to prepare the patient for the procedure, for example, if the platelet count is uh, very low, especially with the stem cell collection, we transfuse uh, the donor or the patient with the platelet. Or if the hemoglobin is below seven, so we transfuse also the patient with the backed RBC before initiating the treatment. Okay, yeah. okay thank you. Uh, there is another question for Ms. BT. Is, is single needle TBE only available for Teremo machines? Yes, right now, yes it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think there is a few more questions related to COVID-19 and vaccination. And we may have another, you know, um, 
sessions for this um, convalescent plasma and the convalescent patient uh, soon, I think, during October, Dr. Ammar, something like that. But we, yeah. we are not for, uh, I, I'm not sure if we, can, we have to close now or we can just uh, give more questions. Um, because uh, I think the time is fast and we have to conclude now. Uh, any questions can be sent it by email or we can just answer it in uh, future uh, you know, sessions on convalescence plasma and COVID-19 disease. Uh, and we are glad that uh, you are all with us today. A lot of participants were with us today. And um, uh, thank you very much for our distinguished speakers uh, for their excellent presentations. And thank you all. Uh, thank you to organizer also and to the Society uh, of Blood Disorders for uh, arranging this uh, very effective and very informative session. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And Good night or goodbye for everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Anur. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Betty. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Tariq, thank you also. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Noor, and see you soon. Bye. Bye.